Imagine asking someone to describe you in just three words. I'd settle for fun, wise, and creative, thoughtful and hospitable, maybe capable, attentive, remarkable. What if the three words they used to describe you, or me, were harsh and badly behaved? Difficult people, we've all got them. Whether it's the coworker you just can't seem to work with, or the family member who points out your every fault, or the spouse who doesn't seem to budge in improving your marriage. Welcome to the Women of the Bible podcast. I'm Erin Davis, and I'll be your host as we walk through the study, Abigail. It's all about learning to deal with the difficult people in your life. 1 Samuel 25 tells the story of a remarkable woman named Abigail who shows us that we can deal with difficult people with grace and faith. The difficult person in her life, the Bible actually does describe him in those three words I mentioned earlier, harsh and badly behaved. So open your Bible, turn to 1 Samuel 25, and join us as we look at the life of Abigail. podcast. I'm Erin Davis. We're so glad that you're joining us. And this season is all about a woman of the Bible you may not have studied before. Her name is Abigail. And I'm joined with some great friends who are going to be walking through Abigail's story together over the next few episodes. I would love for them to introduce themselves to you. First, I have my friend Keisha. Keisha, tell the ladies who are listening about yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Keisha. Griffin, and I am from Los Angeles, where I attend church. Uh, my husband is the pastor there, and I also serve in the women's ministry there. Um, I'm also a blogger, Bible Thinking Woman, and I just look forward to this great study of Abigail together. Have you always lived in L.A.? Always. You do? Have, always. Do you love Born it? Born and raised, love it. Okay. Yes, except the cost. Yes, sure. I've been to L.A. a few times, and I have to say, I'm a farm girl who lives on a farm in Missouri, and just the the number of roads and the number of people (laughs) was a little overwhelming to me, but someday I'm going to come to L.A. and be on The Price is Right. I'll take you. I'll take you. I'll take you. All right. Yeah. Also joined by another friend, Joy. Tell us about yourself. I'm Joy McLean, and I'm just south of Indianapolis, and I've been married for 34 years, have six perfect grandchildren, and I'm a writer, blogger, um, same farm girl, spent a lot of time in the barn. It's yeah. good stuff. Yeah, me too. I live on uh, a hobby farm in Missouri. We're not real farmers, uh, but we have a garden and we have sheep and we have goats. We're going to talk all about that when we meet the people in this story because they had sheep and they had goats. But we promise we didn't bring you here to talk about sheep and goats. But us farm girls could talk about our animals endlessly. Uh, we hope that you're gathered with a group of friends like we are. Uh, ladies, Tell me if this is the same in your life. My life has been so impacted by opening the Bible with other women. I mean, I love to go to church with every kind of people. I love opening the Bible at home. But there's just something about gathering around a table in a living room in a Sunday school class with other women and opening the Word of God. And so that's what we're here to do. Uh, If it sounds like we're just three ladies in a Bible study, we're just three ladies in a Bible study. That's what it's supposed to sound like. We are not theologians. Uh, We, I don't know about you, but I don't have a bunch of fancy Bible degrees. I just love the Word of God and I open the Word of God. And that's what we're going to do here together. We might talk over each other a little bit, just like we would in a Bible study. Yeah. Um, We might interrupt each other. We might move from serious spiritual concepts to, you know, our favorite lip gloss, just like we did, (laughs) would do in a Bible study. Um, And we want you to feel like you're a part of that. One thing I love about these Women of the Bible podcast is we hear from a lot of women that they're doing this in community. Uh, we heard from one mom. She was doing a Women of the Bible study with her daughter who lived in another state. They don't have the opportunity to study the Bible together, but they listen to the podcast together. They walk through the study together, and we love that. That's what we want to see happening. So our goal is to point you to God's Word over and over and over as we're in the Word ourselves. So uh, let's jump in. When you think of Women of the Bible, 
I want to know the names that come to mind, just top of your mind. The women of the Bible, who are the ones that come to mind first thing? Mm, Deborah. Deborah. Esther. Mary. Esther. Mary. Mary. Mary yes. And Abigail. Abigail mm-hmm. now. now. That's Abigail. Right. Abigail. <laughs> Abigail. Uh, Abigail now. I think we are going to, as we walk through this study, we are all just going to grow in our affection for Abigail. We see in her this woman of poise, this woman of faith, this woman of grace, but she really doesn't get much real estate in the Bible. No. Unlike Esther, she doesn't get a whole book. Oh, Esther gets right. a whole book. Right. Uh, you know, Mary, rightfully so, yeah. gets a lot of passages dedicated to her. Deborah, we think of Deborah when we think of the judges, even Eve and uh, Mary Magdalene, some of those women, Mary, Martha, there's lots of Marys in the Bible. Yeah. Uh, we think of women in the Bible, we think of them, but... Um, Abigail is this sort of hidden treasure. And that is what I love about the Bible. It is like a diamond mine. Um, How long have you been studying the Bible, Keisha? I would say um, probably really studying for the last seven years deeply. Okay. Um, You know, my background, I come from some crazy theological background. So I had to relearn a lot of things. And so I would say deeply, truly studying the Bible probably about seven years or so. And Joy, how long do you think you've been studying the Bible? About 20 years. Okay. I I think I'm probably somewhere in between those numbers. I've been walking with the Lord somewhere in the 25 year range. I had my 20th spiritual birthday not long, not too many years ago. But I knew Jesus for a long time before I ever opened the Bible for myself. Um, And and, but now I love the Word of God. I can't get enough of it. And one of the things I love about it is you can read your Bible every day. And every time you open it, you're going to go, I didn't yes. know that was there. Yes. I'd yes. never seen that before. Or maybe it's a verse that you're very familiar with, but suddenly it sparkles like a diamond in the mine and it means something to you that it hasn't yes. met before. Yes. And so I feel like we're on a little bit of a treasure hunt. I felt like that Abigail. with Abigail. Yes. yes. I, did too. I felt like that with Abigail. I think I might have known she was in there. Maybe I'd heard her name. I don't know. But I certainly didn't know the story in the way that we are going to look at the story. So she's a diamond, a diamond we're going to find. But we're going to let's backtrack a little bit um, because it's always so helpful when we look at scripture to take the widest angle view that we can take. Every word in the Bible is part of a sentence, every sentence, part of a paragraph, every paragraph, part of a thought all part of a book and all of that's part of the whole counsel of God. So we want to be careful not to use what I call the claw method. You know, those claw machines that you are a total ripoff <laughs> where you put 50 cents in and the claw drops down. And, oh, I was so close to getting that, but you're never going to get it. Uh, sometimes we can do that with scripture. We can just pluck out a verse or a thought, bits and pieces. Yes. Bits and, pieces. and fortunately, all scripture is God breathed and useful for instruction. So Even when we pluck things out, they're still God breathed. They're still useful. But as we study the Bible, it's so good to just take a minute, um, get as much background information as you can quickly gather. Um, I'm interested. Do you use study Bibles? How do you get the wide angle view before you dig into a passage? Go ahead, Joy. I just love to read I uh, contextually like the whole get the whole big picture. Yep. Like read the whole book and then get the big picture, then go back. And when I start diving in, I really pay attention to the verbs. Mm-hmm. Think what God is doing, what the Holy Spirit doing, what's Jesus doing. You know, idea. what the characters are. But if you really I just have found for me personally, if I really lock into those verbs and see where it's going and then, you know, I journal, I journal, I journal and mm-hmm. flesh it out. Yes. And but yeah, I like to get the big picture, then dive in and get just kind of start dissecting. Yeah. Yes. Keisha? Yes, I actually do the same. And I also like to use a study Bible more so to get the historical context mm-hmm. of, of the scriptures, um, background, setting, theme, um, and then dive in just like joy. So, yeah, it's very important to hear, get the context first. Yeah, right? a great study Bible will put all that information yeah. for you right up front. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a writer. I'm a creative. So sometimes trying to trace historical lines and figure that stuff out is hard for me. So I'm so grateful to study Bible creators who put it right there for me. And so somebody did the thinking for me here in (laughs) first Samuel 25, but I thought we'd just do um, an overview. There's an overview in the study. Uh, Let's look at that really quickly on page nine. My study's all torn up because I've loved it so well. Um, But let's look at who the author is. 
The Bible does not say who wrote 1 Samuel, but many scholars think that the prophets Samuel, Nathan, and God provided much of the material. We always have to list God as an author. All scriptures God breathed and useful for instruction. And the book covers about 110 years, um, and it takes place in the land of Israel. So let's put our minds there, what we're talking about. And let me just read us the first verse, and then we're going to stop there. 1 Samuel 25, verse 1. Now Samuel died. That's the first sentence. How's that for a Wow, opener? what an opener. And all Israel assembled and mourned for him and they buried him in his house at Ramah. Now, this is a Bible study about Abigail, so we might be tempted to go, well, that's a little Let's detail about that. Samuel. Why does it matter? But I think it's worth drilling down there a little bit. What do you know about Samuel from scripture? Who is Samuel? What do you know? Well, he was dedicated, right? And he was set apart I think I love that, even before yes. birth, as Hannah prayed yes. and hoped and believed and trusted that God was going to give her this child, he was so set apart. It yes. seems like from, we all are really, but he was so purposely, um, intimately with God's hand just set apart for his work. Yeah. I love that piece about his character. And that that's too. prior to him even being yes. born. Yes, yeah. yes. Right? And through Hannah's prayer, she that was her, her promise to God. Mm-hmm. If I conceive, I will dedicate this child back to you. And that's exactly what she did. So Samuel is a promise, a fulfilled promise. And so I love that, knowing that about him. Mm-hmm. And he fulfilled that that promise, um, you know, so... Yeah, Hannah is Samuel's mama, and we see her in Scripture praying so intensely that the prophet thinks she's drunk. And um, she just wanted to be a mama so badly. And she makes this vow to the Lord, if you will allow me to conceive, I will dedicate my boy to the temple. Whoa! That was a bold prayer, and she does it. And so that boy becomes Samuel. There's a little nugget in there that doesn't pertain to our story look at Abigail, but I just love it, that talks about how Hannah would visit Samuel every year and bring him a tiny coat, a little tunic. I mean, every mama understands the the impact, the meaning of tiny clothes. Um, And it's right there in scripture. God so cares about the intimate details of our heart. So he's promised he's dedicated to the temple and he first starts to hear the voice of the Lord as a little boy. He's laying down in the temple and he hears something and he runs to Eli and he goes, what was that? (laughs) And Eli says, like everybody, go back to bed, son. (laughs) And then that keeps happening. And it's the voice of the Lord. And Joy, would you read us 1 Samuel 3.19? I will. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. What do you think that means, let none of his words fall to the ground? I wonder if it's like his promise. You know, God, you know, had promised, so nothing was for naught. I mean, he yeah. was faithful to see it through. And how beautiful that is for Hannah. Yeah. Yes. You know, that God made a promise to me and he fulfilled it. He kept his promise. Yeah. He didn't have empty words. They kind of went out like darts. And Samuel had this impact on the nation of Israel that is so important for us to set the stage for before we look at David and Abigail and Nabal. God's hand rested on Samuel from before conception until here we see him die. Um, Verse 20 tells us that he had a reputation of faith in 1 Samuel 3. Um, 1 Samuel 25, he died. And the nation is in mourning. And we need that backdrop because we're going to see David here in a minute. Mm -hmm. And we need to know that David was grieving. This is, who do you think Samuel was to David? Um, He's the prophet of Israel. But how would you describe maybe his impact on David's life? Like a mentor Mm -hmm. and just a spiritual leader and just almost like a covering, you know, an authority figure, like someone to emulate, someone to respect and honor. Yeah. Yeah. He had served as a buffer between David and Saul. We're going to talk here in a minute. There's this really dysfunctional tension between Mm -hmm. Saul and David. And Samuel had been a spiritual intermediary between those. Samuel was the one who anointed David as king. You remember that story? He goes to David's house, tries to go through all the brothers, and finally says, No, that's not him. Do you have anybody else? His dad says, Well, yeah, yeah, there's David. He's out there with the the sheep. sheep. And Samuel, we see him as a man of conviction. He says, Go get him, and I'm not sitting down until he comes here. And the Lord speaks to Samuel and says, 
arise. He's the one. And so it's Samuel that that puts purpose on David's life, that anoints him, that gives him a calling. He's a mentor. He's a pastor. He's a leader. And he's died. I wonder Mm -hmm. if either of you have experienced something like that, a a person of influence in your life, a spiritual influence in your life who's died. And, And what's been the heart impact? Keisha? I haven't had that. You haven't? Not yet. No. Well, blessings for yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Not yet. yeah, absolutely. Not yet. Joy, mm-hmm. can you think I have. of that? Okay. I think in, in just in the big view picture, I remember when Elizabeth Elliot died. Mm. I never knew her, I never met her, but she made such a mark on mm-hmm. my life. You know, just her teachings, her heart, her truth that she had no problem being bold about speaking. Yeah. When Billy Graham died, I felt that loss. I sure. used to, when I was in middle school, send away for his free books, you know, and just yeah. love them. But Personally, I had a great aunt who loved the Lord and had such a life of tragedy. Her husband, her son, both committed suicide. Wow. And she had a third uh, loss. Her son um, died during college. He was only there like a month, and he was killed. But she had... Although she had this great heartache and heart-wrenching sorrow upon her life, she always loved the Lord, Mm. and she always persevered in her faith Mm. and never let those things stop her. And her life was very simple. She was a farm wife, but she just led this life of um, such diligence in her faith. Mm. She had such tenacity, Mm. incredible sorrow that she dealt with every single sure. day. Yes. But it, when she died, when she passed away, she loved music and she taught piano. So her grandkids sang all these great little songs like Jesus Loves Me mm-hmm. and all this. And But it was remarkable that everybody there, like in talking, you know, after the service, they were saying really the same thing. The mm-hmm. essence of what they said was she was the most faithful woman mm-hmm. they had ever known. Now that's a legacy. It is a legacy. And so the woman never traveled probably 10 miles from her home, but the impact she had on the community is profound. And so she, I have her picture, black and white. She's out there collecting eggs on my fridge. This is a reminder of what a godly, faithful woman looks like, no matter the circumstance. I love that. I think when those people leave our lives for whatever reason, there's a vacuum and there's a little bit of a... Um, there's a little bit of a loss of equilibrium. Mm-hmm. And that's where David is, his mentor, his pastor, his his spiritual guide, the man who's put a calling on his life has died. And there's some other circumstances going on. And I just want us to keep that in mind because we're going to talk about dealing with difficult people and we're going to reflect on if we're difficult people. And David faces difficult circumstances and sometimes that turns us into difficult people. I've yes. heard it said that hurt people hurt people, sometimes yes. difficult yes. people or come out of difficult Difficult, circumstances. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also um, want us to just take a minute here to talk about some best practices for studying God's word. There's a reason we took all that time Mm -hmm. to paint all of that backdrop about David and about Samuel, about people we're not necessarily going to focus on in this study. 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us to make every effort to rightly handle the word of God. And if we're supposed to make effort to rightly handle it, it's possible to wrongly handle it. Now, Every time you open your Bible, it's profitable. But I think there's some good things for us to keep in mind. Um, We always look for the bigger picture. That's what we just did. It just took us a few minutes. You can do that anytime you read your Bible. We assume something is literal unless we have a reason to believe it's figurative. So this isn't an imaginary story. It's not a fable meant to tell us a lesson, although... It will teach us a lesson. Um, It actually happened. Abigail existed. David David. existed. Um, Nabal Nabal. existed. This this timeline existed on the timeline Mm -hmm. of history. And here's the important one for us to remember. We always take a God-centered approach to Scripture. I don't know where along the line I figured this out, but the Bible is not a book about me. (laughs) It's a book about God. And do do you ladies face the temptation to look at Scripture looking for yourself and immediately want to jump to application? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, me too. How does this apply right now uh, to me? What does the Lord want me to do right now? <laughs> right now. Yes. And right application only flows out of right understanding. And so while we're going to be talking about people in this podcast, we want to take a God-centered approach. We're looking for God. The purpose of scripture is to reveal the character of God. Um, and so we're looking for God in this story. Any other principles you like to keep in mind as you're studying scripture, Joy? I think it's just God breathed and the Holy Spirit is me. He's my uh, resident teacher Mm. in that even if I'm struggling with the passage or just, you know, how does not just apply to me because that 
yes, guilty. Sure. Yeah. But just how can make help this make sense to me yes. and and really flesh it out yes. that I know that the Holy Spirit he desires the Lord desires for me to understand. Yes, it, so. that's a great point. Yeah. I, I echo that, and I also think that it's important for us to realize when we're reading the Bible that it's not about us, but. It is about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Where is Jesus in this story? Because ultimately, I mean, he himself said, you're searching the scriptures, not realizing they're pointing to me. I am. It's about me. So um, I just think that trying to remember that we're we're trying to have a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. We're not just collect facts Mm -hmm. and to know scriptures so we can, you know, debate with others or. But it's really about trying to understand who God is. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And build on that relationship. Right. So, That's yeah. a good, uh, you know, I, I would imagine any woman who picked up a Bible study on dealing with difficult people mm-hmm. has a difficult person in their mind. Mm-hmm. And what we don't right. want you to do is to use this story to beat that difficult person <laughs> over the head. That's not the point. The point is to find God in it. Yes. And as we'll talk about in the future, uh, we we'll trust God to deal with those difficult people. And he may use the study to reveal that we are the difficult person. So I want us to meet the people we'll spend the next six sessions walking through this study with. First, we have David. We've talked a lot about David. He had been anointed king at this point. Uh, He had defeated Goliath at this point. Um, He's not yet king. Saul is still king, but God had taken his anointing away from Saul because of Saul's disobedience. And Saul's jealousy has grown and he's already tried to kill David a couple of times. And when we find David here in 1 Samuel 25, David is on the run from the anger of Saul. He's got a whole bunch of friends with him. Uh, He's not exactly uh, camping alone in the wilderness, but he's on the run from the anger and the wrath of Saul. Then we meet the guy we're going to learn to love to hate, (laughs) Nabal. And I just have to say... We're not going to like him. No, it's, we're we're, we're, gonna, we're looking for redemption in everybody. Yeah. He is, Nabal is made in the image of God, but we're not going to like Nabal. He is, <laughs> he is easy to not like. So right. uh, who's got uh, verses two through three? I will. All right. Can you read it for us? Now, there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel. And the man was very rich, and he had 3,000 sheep and a 1,000 goats. And it came about while he was shearing the sheep in Carmel. Now the man's name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. And the woman was intelligent and beautiful in appearance. But the man was harsh and evil in his dealings. And he was a Calebite. Okay. So we get a lot of information right there. I mean, if this was Nabal's Twitter bio, <laughs> right. we would have what we need to know about the man. So what yeah. do we see? What do we know about Nabal just from these two verses? Right. Harsh. He's harsh. Evil. He's evil. And he's also very wealthy. He's, he's rich. rich. He has a great responsibility. He's yes. rich. Yes. He has a lot of sheep. Yes. He has a lot of goats. Joy and I both have livestock. How many goats do you have? Well, not a thousand. No, me neither. <laughs> I wouldn't want to feed a thousand. No kidding. Oh, Uh, I don't have goats anymore because goats don't like to stay in fences. Do you have that problem? So he's probably in open pasture somewhere. So goats are always giving trouble. They are ornery, ornery, ornery. I do have sheep. We probably have 20 sheep. Um, But this is a man who is rich. He's wealthy. It reminds me of that verse that the Lord sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not necessarily a sign of your faithfulness if you have a lot of wealth or not. That's not a good litmus test, but he is wealthy. Uh, And your passage, how does your passage describe him? Can you read it to us again? Harsh Harsh. and evil in his dealings. And evil in his dealings. Mine says um, that he's harsh. And that's the Sorry, it's the NASB. Okay, yours is NASB. Mm -hmm. Mine says harsh and badly behaved. Joy, what's yours say? Badly behaved. Badly behaved. Uh, I ask that because, you know, when we're not in here in a room with women who believe like we believe and, and trust the Bible like we do, one thing we'll hear out there is, Well, you're all reading different Bibles anyway. You don't even know what you believe. And it's just not true. We are reading different translations and we get the same Same picture of Nabal. We just still don't like the man. He is harsh. He's still evil. He's evil. He's badly behaved. He's hard to like. It also says he's a Calebite. 
Yeah. And this is where you'd have to do some digging again. And I would say as you're reading the Bible on your own, if there's those questions, if you don't know what that is, pay attention. Uh, It's not a race and take some time and dig. So um, Caleb was one of the two spies who trusted the Lord to go into the promised man, land. You probably sang that song. Ten were bad and two were good, right? <laughs> so Caleb and Joshua were the two that went into the land and they saw the grapes that they could carry on poles and they saw a land flowing with milk and honey and they said, the Lord has promised us this land, let's take it. And the ten other spies said, no, we can't do it. So Caleb, we see in Caleb a faithful man who trusted God. Numbers thirteen six tells us he's of the tribe of Judah. Who else is of the tribe of Judah? Jesus. Jesus, that's right. So they're of the same tribe. So um, Nabal, though he's evil in his dealings, though he's harsh, though he's mm-hmm. badly behaved, his lineage mm-hmm. is people of God. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what happened there with <laughs> him. We lost his way. We, we lost <laughs> his way lost in some way. way. Yeah. But then we get to Abigail, and as much as. Um, Nabal will annoy us. Uh, Abigail will intrigue us. So let's read about Abigail in verse three. Now, the name of the man was Nabal and the name of his wife, Abigail. The woman was discerning and beautiful. What a combination. But the man was harsh and badly behaved. And he was a Calebite. Discerning and beautiful. Um, What a great description. And I'm curious what words would you like others to use when they describe you? If somebody called me discerning and beautiful, I'd be okay with that. I would be quite okay uh, yeah, with that. Yeah, that's okay. But what words would you love for people to use to describe you? I actually like the word discerning. I do too. I like it. I mean, wisdom. Yes. Yeah. yes. She's yes. full of wisdom. Love that's that. what I want to be. Yeah, you know, I so that. I love wisdom, discerning. Who doesn't want to be beautiful? Yeah, beautiful. beautiful. I mean, just tack that one on, too. Just, we all yeah, want that. Yeah, we want yeah. that. So. <laughs> so, yeah, discerning, wisdom, full of wisdom. Love that. Yeah, faithful. Yes. Trusting. Yes. Good. Yeah. Joy, what, what do you I, want I, people to say about you? Just ditto what she said, but yeah. full of grace, yes. full of mercy, you know, full of love. Just, yeah. you know, yes. you want people, when they walk away from you, to feel like they've not just been with you so much as they've had an encounter with the Lord. Yeah, yes. I love that. So I love that. Yes. Yeah. My pastor said from the pulpit a couple of weeks ago, Aaron knows her Bible. And I thought, I can die right now. That's as good as it gets. Just <laughs> put that on my tombstone. Somebody say Aaron knows yeah. her Bible. Isn't she knew the good? word. That is oh, good. I, love I always that. said that I want actually to have, you know, that I finished my race. Yes. I just want to finish. I want to finish. Right. Faithfully. Finish well. yes. yes. And strong. Mm-hmm. And strong. And, and strong. if people could say I make the best chocolate chip cookie in the world, <laughs> I could too. <laughs> but what we see in Abigail is that she is discerning. She's beautiful. As we read about her, we'll see she's a woman of grace, even though she lives with a difficult man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there are women listening who live That's with a difficult yes. man yes. or a difficult child or, or a difficult parent. neighbor or a difficult parent. Parent, yes. And yet we see in her a woman who's discerning and beautiful. Yes. And then there's David. Um, we know some things about David's character um, already. We, When we think of David, we might think about his um, sin with Bathsheba. That hasn't happened yet. Um, but we see a man of faith. We see a man of courage. Um, he's the one that slayed the giant. Yeah. He has fought lions. Yeah. He obeys the Lord. And these are the people um, that we're going to spend some time with in trying to learn how to deal with difficult people. And what they teach us is that we don't have to let harsh and badly behaved people turn us into harsh and badly behaved yes. people yeah. um, because they respond differently to this man that scripture is clear Um it isn't very much fun to be around. Yeah. And and to circle us back to David, this is a man who's grieving. Yeah. This is a man who's on the run. Yes. This is a man who's probably under a lot of stress. The king wants to kill him. Yes. And yet we'll see in him a choice. He doesn't have to respond in right. harsh ways. So there's some questions in the study that I thought we'd just walk women through. I don't know how you're listening to this. Um, I don't know if you're in your car. I don't know how you're listening. But I would encourage you when you can to get yourself to page 15 in the study. And there's some tough questions here. Uh, we're not going to walk through all of them here in the podcast, but I thought we'd tackle a couple of them. And I'll tell you what I'd do if I was doing this Bible study for myself. I would consider these rhetorical. I would think, <laughs> I don't have to actually answer <laughs> those questions. Because right. they're there all on nice a list. Uh, I those are sweet. Yeah, I hope sweet. someone else yes. wrestles with those. <laughs> but what we want women to do is actually talk about these with each other. Actually ask these questions of the Lord yes. and invite him to do some work. So here it is. 
am I sometimes impossible to deal with? I'll let y'all go first. (laughs) (laughs) I would hope not. Yeah. But I'm sure there are moments when I am, you know, when I am impossible to deal with. Yeah. At least my husband probably will say that. Yeah, that's who we should ask this question yeah, of. Yeah, really we should ask our husband these yeah. questions. But yeah. yeah, I'm sure there are times when I'm impossible to deal with. Yeah. Yes. Think, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Especially I, I mean, with my husband, you know. Yeah. And that may look at temperament, just attitude, yes. just being, you know, short with him Great. or my expectations. Yes. You know, yes. A, that can go a mile down the road yes. just with my husband alone. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, my husband is actually in the other room listening to us record this podcast. <laughs> I don't want him to answer this question. He has a front row seat to my sin, unfortunately. But I'm sure there are. I, 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 um, I can think of some of the things that trigger that in me. When I'm tired, yeah. I should just go to bed. Yeah, because I can get so out of sorts, and little things can become big things. Everything becomes a mountain when it's all just right. molehills, right? right. Um, or or when I'm overextended. Yes. Um, I know myself. Oh, yeah. I know that I can basically handle two evenings a week where we're running. Mm-hmm. And we have four little boys, so that's a hard boundary to keep. And if we're running three or four nights a week, I get impossible yes. to deal with. Yes. yes. I get stress so does stressed. That. Yeah, stress does that for me, too. And, yeah. um, you know, I don't, I don't usually like recognize it till I'm yeah, ugly. I, mm-hmm. I don't I like that. Yeah. But I think it's good for us to pause here and ask, okay, what yes. are the things that make me that make hard, hard to deal with? Yeah. Here's a secondary question. Are people not on honest with me for fear that all blow up. And here's what I want us to think mm-hmm. through. Who could we ask that question of? Do we have people in our lives that we could take that question to? Yes. That the women in this Bible study could take that question to? It's maybe not it's not a social media kind of question. You don't want right. to throw that out there for the masses. Right. But what kind of people would you encourage women to take that question to and ask for an honest answer? I think they're again family. Yeah. Yeah. That's us. Family. Well, I was going to say church family, actually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, like for, for myself, I'm very, very close with the ladies of my church. OK. So I, I think this is a question that I can, you know, ask them. Is this, you know, have you ever been afraid to be honest with me in fear that I'll take it the wrong way? Mm. Yeah, that's yeah, great. And so. then we can't blow up when they give us an can't honest blow up answer. Like, really? You know. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, maybe so. it's one good friend or maybe or it's your friend. women's Bible study yes. group. Or maybe it's your husband. Maybe it's your husband sister. Husband for sure. Mm-hmm. But husband I think it's sure. as part of walking through this study, a bold and scary step would be to say, "What do you do you see this in me? Are there times when you're afraid right. to be honest with yeah. me because... I'm impossible to do. Older with. children, you know, teenage years. This sure. is so important imperative that they have that freedom and comfort to come to you rather than just hide and not speak and mm-hmm. not just flare in anger when they bring something up. That's so good. Our oldest is 11. So You're we're starting to get into the. Yeah. Yes. We care about our hair very much all oh. of a sudden in our house. Um, so it's good to know. It's, I think it's good to ask those diagnostic mm-hmm. questions as you as you parent. And here we go. Another question from this list. Do I answer roughly rather than graciously? We're going to see in Abigail an opportunity to respond gruffly or roughly, but instead she gives grace. Yes. And where in your own life do you see a temptation to be sharp or rough or gruff uh, instead of responding with grace? What are the those things that trigger that for you, Joy? I think, well, they're again family. I think we could apply that all, all the time to our own household. But I think when we're out and about, like if we're in a hurry, we're at the gas station, we're at the store, we're at something, and, and the person behind the counter, if, you know, they're we need to have grace or grace for someone in line or just if someone cuts us off in the road. I think just those yes. brief encounters can can just really get to us. I feel because... convicted. I had the world's slowest Walmart <laughs> checker last week. Mm. 35 minutes I that was waiting. Quite... And I was like, <gasps> <gasps> I didn't say anything, but she, she got the vibe. She felt yeah. it. She got she the she vibe. Felt it. Yeah, we can that's be just good. so impatient Absolutely. out and about, you know, in our communities. We can just Absolutely. Be... Like annoyed. And this is actually yeah. my weakness here mm. because I am so direct mm. that it sometimes does not come across graciously. Yes. Oh. And my husband and, you know, my mom and probably friends can attest to that. I, I'm i truthful and everyone, you know, appreciates being truthful, but sometimes it just comes off a little too hard. I have the same struggle. Are you a firstborn? Yes. Me too. 
And and I say I'm not type A, I'm type type double A. Like right. I just task, I task, well. task, task, yes. task, task, task. Yes. So to me, I'm saying yes. this is the deal. This is this Let's get deal. it done. Let's get it done. But I've watched people melt under it, and the Lord yes. has to help me with it's graciousness. So hard. It is mm-hmm. hard. It is so hard. So, so I yes. I hope that as you're walking through the study, you won't consider those questions rhetorical. You'll actually <laughs> walk through them. And let that let's wrap this up by just telling the women who are on the other side what we hope for them. You know, we want them to walk through this study and we want the Lord to do something in their lives. So if you could just have one hope, Keisha, for the woman who's going to walk through this study with us, what would it be? My hope would be that if we are convicted, it's a good thing Mm -hmm. to embrace that because ultimately it brings out the Christ likeness in us, which we're trying to actually become more like Christ. Mm -hmm. So don't reject or suppress that conviction or dismiss it, but actually to embrace it and allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us so that we can extend that grace and love to others as well. So yeah. Yes. Joy, what's your hope? I think, you know, obviously they're doing a study of Abigail. They probably have a difficult person in their life or in a circumstance situation. And so I would want to say to her that God is in it. Yes. He's not forgotten you. He sees you. He sees your tears, your frustration. And as much as God wants to deal with that person, he also wants to deal with you. Yes. Kind of like what you're saying. Yeah. But that God is in this and he has not abandoned you. And he's still working in your life. Yes. I love that. And I, I hope there's thousands of women who walk through this study in this podcast. Yes. And I always like to think, what could God do? Mm-hmm. What could God do with thousands of women who decide mm-hmm. to respond like Abigail? What yes. could God do with thousands oh. of women who decide to be women of discernment and true beauty? And so that would be my hope for us. Yes. yes. Amen.